And now, one of the men who's going to change this country. He's only 42 years of age, a university president. National Review called him Obamacare's Nebraska nemesis. The Republican nominee for the United States Senate from the state of Nebraska, Ben Sass. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Uh, that is a tough act to follow, as you might imagine. Uh, I have a niece. My little sister's uh, daughter has two heroes in the world, and they are Sarah Palin and Phil Robertson. So uh, her uncle, uh, me, uh, is some guy who she doesn't understand what running for Senate means, but she knows that we had Governor Palin come and campaign with us in Nebraska, and that was pretty great. And she heard that I was speaking after Mr. Robertson tonight, uh, so she's decided whatever this running for Senate thing is, she's okay with it now. Um, I also have uh, a three-year-old son. In my house, we have three little kids. Melissa and I, my wife of 19 years, have three little kids. Uh, our girls are 10 and 12, and our boy is three. And my girls might have been in trouble a little bit the last couple of days. And at our house, when you get in trouble, what that means is the alarm clock goes off somewhere between 4 and 5.30 the next day, depending on what the offending crime was. And we do yard work at our house, and Dad gets to spend extra bonus time with the girls. And so this morning, the girls and I were outside working in the, on the property, and uh, our three-year-old boy, who, like three-year-old boys will be, is obsessed with firearms. He all of a sudden appeared outside in footsie pajamas at about six o'clock, which is about an hour before his wake-up time. And as he comes walking up, I felt like we were on the set of Duck Dynasty. He arrives in our backyard. We weren't really expecting him. And in each hand, he's carrying a long gun, and he announces, hey, I'm here. So I felt like he thought, hey, I'm here at uh, the RLC. So it's, uh, it's good to be with you all, and uh, I feel like my, my kids are here uh, in spirit as well. Um, I'd like to start by introducing myself real briefly. I'm a 42-year-old non-politician, uh, so a lot of folks don't know who I am. I've never run for anything before in my life. Um, and to give you a sense of just how new to politics I am, Last summer, when my wife and I decided to go on a listening tour after a lot of prayer and debate at our house, we decided to spend two months traveling Nebraska on a listening tour about potentially getting into the open Senate seat race in Nebraska. There was a poll done at the end of the summer as we were deciding that we were going to run, uh, and it had the front runner in my race had 85% name ID. And I had 3% name ID, but it was in a poll that had a margin of error of plus or minus 5%. So statistically, that meant there was a chance that I didn't actually exist. I, I called up my mom, and I, I said, Mom, I'm not great at math, but I don't know what negative 2% name ID is, but I'm upset that you never take those polls, because you, of all people, could have at least answered the phone and got me from negative 2 to 0 0.01 or something. So. Um, I live in my hometown. I, my, Melissa and I are raising our three kids a mile from where I grew up, and we have an idyllic life. I'm a 42-year-old, never run for anything before. Most of my background is in, in business and crisis management and uh, corporate and not-for-profit turnaround projects. And for five years now, I've been college president in my hometown. So I'm president of Midland University, and I'm legally obligated to tell you I'm not here speaking on behalf of them in any capacity. Uh, but I am in my hometown serving as a college president, um, but that has nothing to do with why I'm running for Senate. I'm running for Senate because I'm an American dad, and I think we have a moral obligation to leave this country as great and free and opportunity filled for the next generation as we were blessed to inherit from our parents and grandparents. <clears throat> We're, we're not on a pathway to doing it, uh, but we need to, and it's going to take a lot of hard work because what President Reagan used to regularly say is just as true today as when he would say it in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and that is, in a republic, you're always only one generation away from the extinction of freedom. This isn't a new problem. This is a problem that has to do with the nature of a republic, and it's a good problem to have, which is when we believe that we the people rule, we give government authorities. Government doesn't give us rights. God gives us rights by nature, and government is our shared project to secure those rights. When we have the responsibility to pass on the obligations of self-rule, self-discipline, self-restraint, and self-control to the next generation, we need to admit that that doesn't happen by genetics. That doesn't happen in the bloodstream. 
our kids become Americans because we teach them the meaning of America. And that's why I'm running for Senate. What I'm, what I'm here to talk about tonight is the fact, what I was invited to talk about is that I, because I'm a new politician and I've been living on a campaign bus for seven months, I'm partly here just to be in a nice hotel bed instead of on a campaign RV. Um, but what I'm here to do is give you just a brief report from the field of what we found over the course of the last seven months. I don't know if what we lived in Nebraska, living on this campaign bus with three little kids who have terrible breath in the night, I, I don't know if what we learned in Nebraska is truly generalizable to the whole country. I think it is. Um, but the reason I want to give a report on it is because national media followed our race a lot. For those of you who uh, maybe followed our race a little or didn't follow our race at all, I'll give you just the comedic interlude of the national media's interpretation of our race. So as the race began, um, every story that was written used some version of long shot candidacy, dark horse about me, and inevitable about my opponent. And the reason was that I was going to lose and somebody else was going to win is simply because he'd been involved in politics before and I'd never run for public office before. And so the media would write, this is a long shot candidacy that doesn't have any chance. But when I would travel Nebraska and I would tell people what my business history had been and what I cared about fighting for to teach the kids at our college and that I was a non-politician, they would cheer. And so you had this sort of schizophrenic experience of the media saying you didn't have a chance to win because you weren't a politician and yet the people saying, man, we want something besides more politicians. So as we started out in the race, first we had no chance. And then Twitter and social media decided that the really important issues of the race were how bad my hair is and how bad my teeth are. I, you know, my wife is of the view that even though I'm 42, orthodontics should still be in my future, but I never took it all that seriously until this debate broke out on Twitter about whether or not Ben Sass's teeth are, quote, so bad that he could eat a carrot out of the wrong side of a chicken wire fence. So, those are the really important things that national politics uh, bring you if you decide to become a candidate. But the really important part of phase one of the campaign for us was because my current position was college president and I didn't have a chance to win, I was inevitably not very conservative because my title was college president. So we just decided to ignore all that and go and actually start talking to, to voters instead of listening to reporters. And the first thing we found is that the political consultants who told you you couldn't possibly run a race talking about the Constitution were completely wrong because we ran a race talking about the Constitution because it's what the American creed is about. And we don't need more politicians that think Washington is the center of the world. We need poor, more people who run for public office who recognize that the great paradox at the center of American political life is that in American history, politics have never been at the center of American life. And so what we've been up to in our race was just going and talking to the voters, doing town halls all day, every day. We literally lived on this campaign RV, and we would travel the state. Nebraska has basically two population centers, but we have 93 counties. And so you have to work these small towns of ag communities of 500 to 3,000 people, and we would go and we would do policy serious town halls all day, every day. And political consultants would call us and say, voters are not interested in that stuff. They want you to tell them how you're going to get on the right appropriations committee and you're going to deliver them free stuff. And when we traveled the state, our voters didn't talk about any of that stuff. So all of a sudden, we started finding that when we did what the politicians, uh, political class said you couldn't do, which was talk policy ideas and the meaning of America with voters, we started getting all-time record crowds in the history of Nebraska politics. Well, then the national narrative on our story changed. All of a sudden, I went from being a college president who must be a non-conservative to somebody who national media defined as a knuckle-dragger, a mouth foamer, uh, somebody who wanted to burn down the government, uh, and somebody who was just inevitably only interested in tearing things down when all we were doing on, our, on the campaign trail was talking about building up and recovering the meaning of America and poking a hole in that myth that government can solve all problems in life. Because the reason a guy like Phil Robertson spoke before us at a political conference is because Americans fundamentally believe that the things that happen in local community are really where American life is lived, not in Washington, D.C. 
we had a commercial. You can check it out at benfornebraska.com if you're interested. Uh, our website is benfornebraska.com, all spelled out. We had a commercial that was a little bit tongue-in-cheek about moving the U.S. Capitol to a cornfield in the middle of Nebraska and leaving the lobbyists and the influence peddlers behind. No one in Nebraska was confused about the fact that we weren't really talking about the physics and the logistical challenges of digging the capital out of the ground and trying to load it on flatbed trucks. <laughs> we were talking about the Ninth and Tenth Amendment and the fact that in the American system, in the you did build that worldview, the center of life is the private sector. And by that, I don't just mean for-profit businesses, though I obviously mean that, but I mean civil society and mediating institutions and family as the building block of society and neighbor helping neighbor. The center of America is always things that happen outside the compulsory powers of taxation and regulation and prohibitions that come from Washington. And of those governance functions that are necessary, the vast majority of them happen at the state and local level. And so when we talked about moving the capital back to a cornfield, we really weren't trying to discriminate against Baton Rouge and Lafayette and New Orleans. Uh, we were talking about the fact that almost all governance, whenever possible, should be delivered at the state and local level. And so we had a great time, except that all over, thank you. Uh, all over uh, social media, liberals were apoplectic that this crazy guy who used to be a college president was now so stupid that he thought we could physically move the architecture of the Capitol. <laughs> well, then all of a sudden, we won. And thank you. And even though we were supposed to be you know, the candidate that had no chance and the other candidates in my race were inevitable. And there were some really good men running in my race. I want to be clear about that. There were five people in my race and four had pretty put together and well-funded, uh, vigorous campaigns. There were four real candidates in our race. We ended up more than doubling up everybody else in the race. And all of a sudden, the national media story on our race became that I had always been the candidate of the lobbyist class and the establishment, even though they funded independent expenditures to run attack ads against me in Nebraska. And so we lived a, a race that was just almost schizophrenic to read in national newspapers compared to what was actually happening on the ground in the race. So if you would allow me to, um, and I get that it's, it's the national liberal media's favorite game to tell the story of Republicans fighting Republicans, regardless if it has much to do with what's actually happening on the ground. They were going to bigfoot and imprint this story on our race, even though in our race we always wanted, as my 10-year-old daughter says it, all the votes. We wanted more Second Amendment advocates and more pro-lifers and more small business people and more people who believe that religion, not politics, are the place that families actually cohere and where most important uh, meaning is found. We wanted more Tea Partiers or constitutional conservatives. We wanted more of everybody. And what was actually happening, <clears throat> what was actually happening in our race was we were pulling together those crews. But the national story of the race all of a sudden became, well, in, in a narrative where everything is about Republican fighting Republican and there's some so-called establishment and some so-called Tea Party fighting proxy wars in every race, I was now apparently the candidate that Washington had picked, even though we said from the very beginning, we didn't need a job, we didn't want a new title, I don't want to commute, but we're going to because our kids are going to be raised right where they're raised now. I'm sure parents in Louisiana and Virginia and Maryland and Washington, D.C. have all sorts of ways to get their kids' labor to build character. I just don't know how to do it. I only know how to do it by walking beans, detasseling corn, and giving my daughter's yard work at 5 a.m. So they're going to grow up right where they're growing up right now. And we have said from the beginning of the race that we wanted more quality and more quantity. We wanted a Republican Party that was clearer about the big ideas that we're for. We want better candidates, better ideas, more persuasion, and we want a majority because we want to retire Harry Reid and Senator Landrieu. When the race started, saying we wanted more quality and more quantity was supposedly an attack on anybody who was currently holding office because we were saying there wasn't enough quality. And when we said we wanted more quantity after we won, supposedly the only thing we cared about was doing whatever Washington told us, even though the lobbyist class had run political attack ads against us. So if you followed our race, let's throw that all away. And instead, I'd love to tell you the four things that Melissa and I learned on the campaign trail because they're darn heartening. Well, overall, they're heartening. One of them's really 
pessimistic. And so I want to tell you, the main thing, the, the net takeaway is the people in Nebraska believe in the Constitution. Contrary to what President Obama believes, they believe in American exceptionalism. <clears throat> They believe in independent living, not more dependency and government handouts, because nobody, even the 47%, we don't believe that those people who are created with dignity in the image of God really want their kids to grow up just trying to get free stuff, as opposed to have an actual earned success. So here are the big four takeaways uh, from what we learned on our, our seven months living on a campaign bus. Number one is scary, so let me brace you for some bad news. Uh, they don't know what our party stands for. Uh, we've got some big problems in the Republican Party. Our folks are not just skeptical of Democrats. They're skeptical not just because Democrats are in charge, but because they think that most of the Republicans that are involved in politics want Washington to be in charge, and they don't want that, I don't want that, and you don't want that. What we need to be able to persuade people is that Republicans have a different vision, which is a truly limited government that creates a framework for ordered liberty where life is lived in Louisiana and in Nebraska and Arkansas and Montana and New York, not in Washington, D.C. And right now, we're a long way away from persuading them of that. If we give our voters the false choice between Democrats as the party of big government bad ideas and Republicans as the party of no ideas too often, we lose. If we give voters the bad choice between Democrats as the party of big government bad ideas and us as the party of sort of big government light, we lose. If we give voters the choice between Democrats as the party of big government and Republicans as the party of big business cronyism, we lose. And my state is the fourth most conservative state in the union in terms of uh, presidential voting history. And yet right now, increasingly, as you travel our state, people say things to you at every town hall that says, I'm conservative, but I don't know if I'm Republican anymore. We have to get a lot better about communicating our ideas. The second big takeaway, <laughs> the second big takeaway is an opportunity. And that is, they don't want us to just fight Obamacare, though we obviously need to fight that monstrosity. They want us to fight the Obamacare worldview. Because Obamacare isn't just terrible legislation. It isn't just fake budgets and the imposition of 68,000 bureaucrats between doctors and patients. It isn't just a whole bunch of false promises uh, that started about getting 47 million uninsured people insured, and now we're at the place where we talk about 7 million, and it isn't insured, it's enrolled. And the majority of the people who appear to be newly enrolled in Obamacare are just people that Obamacare made uninsured last year. It's sort of like if the manager of a Target burned down a Walmart and then invited all the fleeing customers to walk across the parking lot into his store saying, look at all the business I created. Um, Ob Obamacare isn't just bad health policy. It is really a failed worldview. We traveled this last year with the 22,000 pages implementing pa regulations, uh, the 22,000 pages of implementing regulations of Obamacare in the belly of our bus. Uh, I read Obamacare, uh, the law, I want to be clear, uh, the law was about 2,300 pages of uh, draft bill language in 2009. Remember Speaker Nancy Pelosi, she was Speaker of the House at that time, said we needed to pass Obamacare to find out what was in it. Uh, 2009 was a slow period in my life, so I went and read it. Uh, I don't recommend it to anyone. Uh, but I read Obamacare the law. I wouldn't read Obamacare the, stat, uh, the, um, the regulations, but we carry it in the belly of our bus as a picture of what government wasn't meant to do, cannot do well, and will, will inevitably fail at. And we would take it from the belly of our bus up onto the front of the room uh, at every town hall we did across Nebraska over the last seven months. It's nine and a half feet high. The 22,000 pages of regulation, we put a big metal rod through it and anchored it into a dolly, and we take it up to the front of the room, and we just give people a picture of what this is. Um, this is a law that was passed four years ago and has only been implemented or being implemented uh, for about five months right now, and it's almost 10 feet tall, and as you go to town hall meeting rooms all across our state, in most places, you couldn't get the top section on. We'd have to take the metal rod out and pull some of the papers off because it wouldn't fit in under the ceiling. And we would contrast that with the Homestead Act of 1862. 
I tried to come up with a way to think of how we could connect Louisiana and Nebraska without having to talk about times when the Huskers had dominated the Tigers in football games. <laughs> and I realized, I realized the best, a uh, uh, brief parenthetical comment. Uh, the last time I was with Governor Palin before just seeing her backstage, she and Senator Cruz and Senator Lee came and campaigned with us in Nebraska at one point. And Governor Palin at least showed the home team spirit as an honorary Nebraskan to wear Husker garb when she was uh, on the stage with us. And uh, we, Governor Palin and I gave Ted Cruz a hard time because he wasn't wearing any Husker gear. And I thought, you know, that would be appropriate to treat his hosts with respect in our state. Uh, and in the midst of the event, as Governor Palin and I ribbed him for not having any Husker gear, he flashed a hook 'em horn sign to the crowd in our state, and the Omaha World Herald wrote up that my campaign was bringing a new level of dirt and smut to Nebraska politics <laughs> by bringing a Texas politician and allowing him to make obscene gestures at campaign rallies with children present. The Homestead Act of 1862, if you need a history refresher, um, is the piece of legislation by which most of the former Louisiana Purchase was settled. In 1862, 270 million acres of America were settled because of this piece of legislation that created a framework for opportunity, created a framework for ordered liberty. I'm a fifth generation Nebraskan. I'm descended from farmers on both sides of my family and the most important work I've ever done is a nine to 15 year old kid walking beans into tassel and corn. And I got that <clears throat> because my parents and grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents grew up working on the farm and they worked the land and they did build that. Government didn't build that, though there was, there was a piece of legislation that created the framework by which the Homestead Act led to the settlement of the Midwest. The Homestead Act of 1862 is two pages long. The middle third of America was settled. The legislation created a framework, but the people built that. And so I have this kind of recurring dream slash nightmare. We have a big uh, museum in Nebraska called the National Homestead Act Memorial Museum. And you should come to it if you're ever in Nebraska. It's one of the, the great museums in America. It's like going back to Little House on the Prairie, but not as a TV show, but the real sod farms uh, that our ancestors, or Nebraskans' ancestors, uh, first settled in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. And I have this kind of, talk about schizophrenia, I have this recurring nightmare that we should try to invite President Obama to Nebraska and have him come to the National Homestead Act Memorial and try to deliver the you didn't build that speech. I, I, I don't mean it disrespectfully. I mean sincerely as a thought experiment in terms of what America means. You couldn't stand there with a speech or with a teleprompter and try to stutter out and say all of those goofy things that are in the you didn't build that speech. Because our people would look up at him, and really in a Nebraska nice kind of way, I don't think in a disrespectful way or a jeering way, um, I think our people would look up at him and just say, Mr. President, what are you talking about? We didn't build that. Our ancestors built the farms, the ranches, the schools, the churches, the small businesses, the not-for-profit associations. They built the dreams of their kids and grandkids. And we believe it isn't just an inheritance. It is a blessed inheritance, but it's more than that. It's a moral obligation. It's a stewardship responsibility that we have to pass along America to the next generation. And to, to take the thought experiment a little bit further, there's a danger in conservatism when we see government this out of control, growing this far beyond the bounds of what limited government in the founder's vision meant. And so sometimes in conservatism, when we're frustrated at governmental overreach, at that nine and a half foot stack of regulations that isn't just 22,000 pages, but it's 13 times that the law has been rewritten by the regulatory process in the executive branch in ways that directly contradict the written text of the statute. Um, it isn't just that, though. It, when we're frustrated with it, we have to be sure we don't talk as if government has no purposes. Because government has some important purposes. They're limited, enumerated purposes, but they're real. And so, Mr. President, if you were in Beatrice, Nebraska, where the Homestead Memorial Act is, um, if you look down uh, the main street, you'll see two or three houses that have yellow ribbons tied around oak trees. And the reason they're there is because Johnny's off fighting in the Marine Corps to build the best fighting force the world has ever known to secure our freedoms. And we're grateful that he's doing it. And we salute him and we salute all of you who've worn the uniform to defend our freedoms. 
but Johnny's not doing that because he's confused and he hopes he gets promoted to the Pentagon so he can retire in Washington, D.C., the center of the universe. He's doing it to fulfill his obligations because this is a federal duty to secure the border uh, and to guarantee national security and to make certain infrastructure investments for interstate commerce. But he's doing it because he wants to move back to Beatrice, marry Susie, and they want to raise their kids here because Beatrice, Nebraska, and New Orleans, Louisiana are the center of the world. And that's what America has always meant. And our people don't want us to just explain that Obamacare's bad legislation. They want us to attack the root of the idea that the federal government can solve every problem, that if you love your neighbor, the only way to express it is by committing yourself to more, fed, more programmatic spending by Washington bureaucrats. They don't believe that. Obamacare isn't just bad um, economic and health policy. Obamacare is also the most aggressive war against religious liberty that we've seen in our time. Because deep, <laughs> deep in those 22,000 pages is an evisceration of the Hyde Amendment. It was 41 years ago that Roe versus Wade and abortion on demand became the, the law of the land in our country. But when that happened, we have never before been forced to subsidize abortion. But now in the last five months, uh, we all in this room via insurance premiums and via tax subsidies are involved with Uncle Sam in the provision of abortion. This is a new and more perilous step and this is a part of Obamacare. Government this big crowds out freedom. And Obamacare fundamentally is an attack on the American idea that if problems are big, if anything is troubling, troubled or troubling in America, only Washington can fix it. And the American people would be better off as dependent subjects again instead of entrepreneurial citizens. And I'm here to give you the great news that the people in Nebraska, they don't believe that. And I believe that's true all across the country. Third, they want us to propose actual solutions. It isn't good enough to just be against things. We need to explain what we're for, but we need to make sure that we define the meaning of America as much bigger than just federal programs. Because the meaning of America is where small businesses are created. It's where people gather on Sunday mornings together. Um, it is where neighbors help neighbors. And it is at some governance level, but it's often what happens in the county in the, in the school boards, uh, in the city halls, and in the state legislatures. The center of American life is not Washington, D.C., but when we explain what we're against about Washington's ever-ending, never-ending growth, we have to be sure that we can explain what we're for. Uh, to quote Arthur Brooks, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, it is pretty clear that we lose if we just explain when we're against things instead of how we're for people. And so in our campaign, we didn't just travel and crusade against Obamacare, though we did that all day, every day. We also explained why we were for what I called the anti-Obamacare recovery plan. And we put out a comprehensive private sector alternative to Obamacare. You should be skeptical of the word comprehensive. Uh, there's a 22,000 page stack of paper here uh, in our mythical vision. Our comprehensive alternative is about 24 pages. And I won't bore you with all the health policy particulars of it, but we are not going to succeed at repealing Obamacare unless we can explain to the American people why there was so much growing uninsurance before Obamacare was passed. But the reason there was growing uninsurance in America wasn't because we had too little government, but because we already had too much government that was perverting, perverting the health marketplace. I will be a policy nerd for you only here for 30 seconds, but I want to give you one fact. If you work for a firm of 200 or more employees, you have a 97% chance of getting employer-sponsored health insurance. If you work for a firm of 10 or fewer employees, you only have a 47% chance of getting employer-sponsored health insurance. And the reason is because Washington, starting in the 1940s and 50s, tried to centrally plan the health finance and the health delivery systems, and they picked winners that were large firms. And today, almost all the job growth in America is happening in the small business space. 
And so fundamentally, the reason for growing on insurance in America is because the economy that we're moving into, where the college graduates from my school that walked the podium a week ago last Saturday, aren't going to stay at the same firm for 26 years as their grandparents did when they got their first job. They're going to stay on average at a firm only about three and a half years each stop through the course of their life, and they're going to end up structurally uninsured for two to six months every time they change jobs. And help me find the liberal media folks who've explained to the American people during the Obamacare debates that the number one cause of uninsurance in America is not socioeconomic status and it is not pre-existing conditions. The number one cause of growing uninsurance in America, simple fact, is job change and Washington politics have created a world where if you stay at the same large firm forever, you don't become uninsured. And if you're that entrepreneur who takes a risk, you, you might be, you're likely to become uninsured. Well, that's when you have the car wreck and that's when you get the breast cancer diagnosis. This was a problem of Washington's making in the tax code that Republicans need to be able to explain how to fix bad central planning in the past. We can't just explain why we're against new central planning in the present. Finally, I think Mike Lee might be with you tomorrow, and I think uh, Senator Lee does a great job of talking about the fact that our founders in the 1770s at the first Tea Party in Boston didn't just explain what they were against. They also went on to the 1780s in Philadelphia and built a constitutional system and explained what they are for. And we in our movement need to figure out how to get much better at telling the American people and the people in Nebraska and the people of Louisiana who are confused about what we're for, we're about an America that's a lot bigger than just more federal programs. Fourth and finally, um, what we learned, what Melissa and I learned on the trail in Nebraska this last year is that conservatives in our state want to win. And when they want to win, they want to grow the conservative movement. They want, to quote my 10-year-old daughter Alexandra, they want all the votes. They want us to go and win new people to this movement. And so again, against the advice of political consultants, we spent a lot of this last year traveling and campaigning in places where there often aren't Republican votes. We spent a lot of time uh, in Hispanic South Omaha, and I got in trouble on our campaign because I'd talked to Democrats in the past. Well, I'm gonna talk to Democrats again in the future because we wanna win them to the right side of the movement for our future. I've been asked regularly in this campaign, I'm gonna close by telling you something about Jack Kemp. I've been asked regularly in this campaign who the formative political influences were in my life. And Kay Orr, who was the first Republican governor in, Nebraska, uh, in America, was elected in 1986. I was a 14 year old kid and it was the first campaign I ever worked on. Uh, so I wanna start with Kay Orr. But on the national stage, Jack Kemp was a guy that inspired me as a teenager to want to grow the conservative movement. He would preach about the American dream as equality of opportunity, how the meaning of America is not about Washington trying to redistribute and divide us, one group against another group, but about the fact that Americans believe in a big, bright future, and our metaphor is never the metaphor of a pie that's fixed size, and there's some chef who she or he gets to divide it up in a knife, with a knife and constantly try to figure out who to empower. Our vision of the American future is always a garden, something that grows bigger and there's more opportunity the more work is put into it. And when you traveled our state, as important as politics are to fix all that President Obama has broken, the real issue that people wanted to talk about in town hall after town hall is, is the American work ethic being passed along to our kids. Because if we pass along the American work ethic to them, their future will be bright, and Washington can't create that ethic, but it can undermine it. And our people want to grow the conservative movement by talking more like Jack Kemp about opportunity. I wanna close with a quote that we use regularly on the trail uh, from, from Congressman Kemp, or more importantly, quarterback Kemp. We may not get every vote, but we will speak to every heart and we will seek to represent the entire American family. For in our campaign, we aim not just to win, but to be worthy of winning. For we believe that in every child, we must see the image of God and the seed of creativity that has been planted in each one of us to build something for the future. And the only way we will successfully oppose bad ideas is to replace them with better ideas. For we, as the inheritors of American exceptionalism, 
We believe that we have before us and for our progeny tomorrows that are more thrilling and more glorious than even were our yesterdays. Thank you for your time. God bless and good night.